Welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Wells' Looking Good and Feeling Great podcast, live from Las Vegas, with his co-host, Daryl Craig Harris. Welcome back. How are you doing? Fantastic. Uh, we're back at it again. How about that? Right. Beautiful Las Vegas. Um, still a little chilly, but not so bad compared to the other parts of the country. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Chilly, chilly parenthesis for Vegas uh, and parenthesis. Exactly. Yeah. No, my... My guys on the East Coast and everything else like that, they just kind of survive this big, deep chill. So God bless them. And there was this little, like, cutout area right around Clark County, Nevada. It was really kind of funny. And then we got some rain, but not like California. And thank God we need the rain. And California desperately need the rain. And we need the uh, Western Rockies ice pack to kind of try to refill uh, Lake Mead because we're finding way too many bodies out there. And so we <laughs> want to put a stop to that. Sadly, that's true. Stop to that. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the mafia was busy in the 70s. So, Anyways, yeah. so um, today we are going to cover uh, trauma. And I know you have a background dealing with trauma patients trauma-related patients um, working emergency room, Philadelphia. So all that good stuff. Tell yeah. us about that. No, we get, <laughs> we get the question not infrequently. It was one of these uh, responses that we got for, and again, if you want to hear about something uh, on this, let us know. This is one of the questions like, oh, Dr. Roth, you have you know terrific trauma stories from Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, yeah. If you do trauma, you're going to have stories just because it's kind of dramatic and, you know, people put themselves in strange situations and you're like, you did what? You know, so. Uh, wow, that's obviously, that's got to be, was it Philly General or where did you work? Well, no, there's not a general, uh, there's a great question. There's not a uh, general hospital per se or county hospital in Philadelphia, but they have five teaching hospitals. So everybody got their little, the way they set it up was everybody got their little piece, the little share, and there's plenty to go around as far as uh, uh, trauma and, and care of that uh, nature. And so there were multiple trauma centers in Philadelphia, but they had a huge catchment area as well. Not only Philadelphia, which was, you know, metropolis, but uh, also the area surrounding it. It was a big feeder on the on the East Coast for that mm -hmm. sort of thing. What was a typical, I mean, I can imagine a typical weekend there would be well, yeah, it was, <laughs> quite busy. Well, well, again, I was back, it was back in the 90s, uh, right. and there was a, what we called a significant knife and gun club uh, around the neighborhood and, and, and such, and uh, a lot of crack flowing through the neighborhoods and, and such like that. And so it made for great training, uh, sleepless nights, but great training. And, uh, and we, we honestly did the best to go ahead and, and really be part and parcel of the community and really try to help as much as we can. Right. And especially that's usually the worst day of somebody's life. And you, you really try to save them, uh, and save if not their life and their limb, uh, and hmm. try to get them back as, as to normal as, uh, as possible. Right. So. What were the most common kind of issues you deal with oh well everything well we'll talk a little bit about uh, trauma and it's you know they kind of separate into blunt versus uh, uh penetrating uh blunt would be your falls uh it would be your assaults it would be uh, car wrecks uh, that mm -hmm. sort of thing and penetrating trauma is usually your, your knife and glove uh things something right. that actually penetrate the body and uh, and then you're worried about uh, internal injuries, et cetera. So, so yeah. So, and we would get a little bit of everything. So we would get because we we're right by uh, 76, the uh, the Schuylkill, which means we got plenty of um, uh, car wrecks. And then by the same token, um, we were over a little bit by the hood. Uh, if you turn turn left, you're kind of in a good place in Philly. You turn right, and uh, little not so good uh, right. place. And so. We were part and parcel of, uh, of that and um, uh, as well. And so we got plenty of that, uh, both uh, knives and, um, and a lot of gunshots. Uh, but uh, again, great training. And the system that they had really was terrific. And they kept modernizing it and really studying it. And so they were really kind of scholars of trauma, uh, which was really sort of interesting. Right. What were some stories that really stick out in your mind about those days? I mean, obviously, you're a young doctor. You're still learning at that at that point. Well, I guess you're always learning, but sure. Um, what were some of the things that really stuck out to you? Well, yeah. I, I, first of all, there's there's the laws of physics, and sometimes the laws of physics don't apply because you're like, how did that get where? You know, so <laughs> right. Or, or you went flying how many feet? And and so the notable exceptions, you know, there's a bell shaped curve, right? But the notable exceptions always kind of you know stood out, mm -hmm. especially guys that you know involved in a motor vehicle accident, and they're talking to you just like you're talking to me, and their blood alcohol level comes back, and they're like. Point seven, like, excuse me, sir, you should be dead, and you're actually talking to me. So. That is interesting. I mean, that that aspect of that, you hear that a lot. That people, especially alcohol or, or people that maybe they're intoxicated, they end up surviving things that maybe they wouldn't normally. Oh uh, yeah, then you know they're a you know professional drinker, you know, and wow. uh, because that that right. they have such a tolerance to it, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
Uh, and then, yeah, I, you know, folks that I still remember this. So uh, one guy, head injury, uh, skateboard, fall, landed on his head, bleed, uh, et cetera. And um, so we got a little bit of history, this and that. And uh, then his talk screen came back and it lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, he was on everything, you know, uh, uppers and downers and side waders and everything else like that. And, you know, you, you get to talk to the folks and, you know, you're the doctor and, and they tell you stuff and, uh, and they say, yeah, maybe I probably should have mixed all that. And you're like, well, yeah, you know, probably a good idea. But that's hopefully that's your teaching point. That's the point that you can intervene and go, you know, you might want to think about X, Y, and Z differently, you know. So, and it, what also is interesting is that some folks, especially in the penetrating trauma world, uh, some of these folks were, uh, let's say, independent businessmen. And you you would talk to them and, and you know, just remember, you know, one guy, real interesting guy, very intelligent and really looked at this as a business proposition and, you know, like, you know, you might want to get out of this business. He says, yeah, no, I did the math, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, yeah, I, you know, I, I knew this was a possibility and I've done the math and yeah, and here I am, you know, because I can yeah. X, Y, and Z. The downside was this and here I am. So it's interesting. Some people have really kind of thought it out and some people are just really in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Especially in any big city, New York, Chicago. Oh, anywhere. You have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different things happening. Of course, like you said, I mean, obviously like just normal accidents that sure. happen. There's a lot of gang stuff. It's all that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so how does that, how did that training really help you being as in terms of being related to plastic surgery? Sure. Dealing with patients, dealing sure. with, with emergency trauma kind sure. of situations. Well, I think trauma, <clears throat> I think, really kind of trains you for a, a couple things. Uh, one is, is you really have to know your anatomy and your physiology, et cetera, et cetera, because you, it's not a planned operation. And you also don't know where the injury really, really is. You have a pretty good idea because, you know, an arrow is sticking out of somebody or a knife. Right. Uh, and uh, But, you, you know, you want to get in there, you really want to get proximal distal control of any bleeding, and you want to know the structure so you can repair the structures. So really, uh, trauma is a very interesting part of it in as much as it's like a pop quiz, you know, uh, uh, every time. But there are certain tenets to it that really, I think, are good for any person, well, any physician, and especially a surgeon, is really a systemic approach or an algorithmic approach. Meaning, the way I did plastic surgery, of course, is, is I went through general surgery first, then I did plastic surgery, and then um, fellowships and such. Nowadays, you do about three years of general and then a year of research and three years of plastic surgery, which is fine. But the thing with the trauma, which I try to take away from, is is really you're taking chaos. You know, here comes a guy coming in with three bullet holes in his chest or uh, in a big bad car wreck and everything else. And he's screaming and they're screaming in the waiting room, et cetera, et cetera. And they go ahead and they put it on the gurney and you put him in the trauma bay, et cetera, et cetera. And it's your job to take chaos right. and make calm out of it. And triage. And, okay. Yeah. So because if you who are, and, and, and you don't run traumas on the first day, right? So first year of medical and then you're an intern, you're going to put a line in or two. And then you're a mid-level resident, you put you know, in chest tubes in, this and that, the other thing. And then you're the chief resident uh, or senior resident, and um, you're running the show and you're determining what's going on and you're making plans in your head and you're running the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you know, you're not doing heart surgery your first day. So, so, and this is over years and years and years and of actually doing this stuff. But basically the word that everybody's looking for is unflappable. Is, right. is you go in there, you say, oh, hmm, that's an interesting finding. I've seen that six times before, and we're going to run the algorithm this way. Yeah. Okay. That's where people are looking for is leadership at the foot of the bed. Because if you, as a team leader or chief or whatever you want to call it, get in there and go, oh, my God, look at this, and there's blood. That, that's no good. People are actually looking for leadership, and they're looking right. for structure, and then you're going to run it. And some of the nurses have been there forever. You're the quarterback. Yeah, you got to be the quarterback, and some the nurses can run it better than you. And when you're when you're starting out, because they've done it so many times and they know the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really, the one idea is is, is and uh, it was you know a, f a famous quote in, uh, in in the House of God, you know, in a code uh, first take your own pulse. Mm -hmm. So when you get there, the first thing to do is take a breath, look around, see who's there, see who's on your team, and just go, okay, what's the story. Okay, and then somebody, usually the EMT or paramedic, will say, "Oh, you know, seventy-two-year-old, you know, male, you know, uh, uh, you know, witnessed a car accident or witnessed gunshot wound, you know, sustaining the following injuries or whatever." And then you have the systemic approach, and the systemic approach actually comes from the American College of Surgeons, and it was really the brainchild of Dr. James Steiner, who in 1974 uh, was in a plane crash with his family. The story is really an interesting story because uh, he had a huge eye injury, and he just went through a plane crash. 
uh, wife killed instantly, had four kids. Three of them were critical. One was okay, but he's now out in the middle of nowhere. So he had to figure out hypothermia. He had to figure out having somebody find them. He had to figure out transport. Right. Once they got them keeping, tra- keeping them alive, well, transported. Right. Then they go to a, a, a hospital in the middle of nowhere, and they didn't know how to handle anything. So he mm-hmm. actually got for the first time a National Guard helicopter to come and go ahead and pick him up because mm-hmm. he was a traumatologist at the major uh, teaching hospital and got him to come in. Um, and so after all of that, and they didn't have spinal protocols and have any sort of this. After that, he says, okay, this was horrific. I have to change this. And he did. He did a systemic approach. And now that was adopted by the American College of Surgeons back in 1976. So he developed a whole program of of protocols. Just like uh, uh, ACLS, which is your advanced uh, cardiac life support, which is, you know, what you see, uh, you know, pounding on the chest and shocks and protocols and all that. He kind of saw, okay, we can do a protocol for heart attacks. Let's do a protocol for trauma. And so, and that's been refined, obviously, over the years, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. And you look at all those things and then you go over it again, you roll them back and forth. You have to look for the missing injuries. You have to spread their butt cheeks. You have to look between, uh, you know, the fingers. And so, and, and guess what? Sometimes somebody will come in with a big, bad injury, multiple uh, fractures, collapse lung, da, 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 da. And then a week later, they say, you know, doc, my, you know, my ring finger hurts. And that's a fracture. Now, is that a missed injury? Well, no, because it, you, you had yeah, you've got to deal with keeping them alive first. Right. And then, it's, you know, you had right. uh, several other distracting injuries, sure. et cetera. But that's, it's, it's a systems approach. And, and the systems start pre-hospital. So now you have folks that know what they're doing pre-hospital, way out in the field. Mm. Those folks know how to triage this. Mm, this is beyond me. Maybe we need flight for life. Maybe we need somebody else to get them to a uh, hospital. And then post-hospital as well, because then a lot of these trauma guys may have challenges because you send them home on the street. Well, that's no good because they're going to go get infected and everything else. So now right. you have to go ahead and get placement uh, and, the, and for them as well. So so trauma has really, really come a, a long way, you know, in the past, you know, 50 years. Yeah, and there's a lot of, lot better options just treatment-wise, even endoscopic and oh, all sorts of other. 100%. Right. And, and, you know, there's operative versus non-operative. How do we take care of spleen injuries? How do we take care of liver, if liver injuries now? Uh, can we get, send them over to interventional radiology to stop the bleeding? Uh, do we, can we, like to your point, can we do this laparoscopically? So, yeah, so things have gotten much more sophisticated, much better over the years. As we expect, hopefully, technological breakthroughs and medical technology breakthroughs as well. Right. But it really comes down, to answer your question, it really comes down to uh, from chaos to calm. And the first right. thing is, is calm yourself. All right, what am I looking for here? Let's run the protocols, et cetera, et cetera, and see what's what's going on. So, so trauma usually falls in two categories, uh, blunt versus penetrating. And there's some mixture because some guy will get shot and then drive to the hospital and wreck his car. So is he blunt or is he penetrating? <laughs> right. Yeah. right. So, and that kind of screws up your statistics. But the main, I mean, I, I would assume right. the main goal when they first walk in the door is we're going to assess if this guy we want to make him live, obviously, so, and then you kind of go back from there, right? right. And that's yeah, yeah and that, and you you get a that's that's my layman. You, you, get, <laughs> I'm looking at you get a funny a funny sense after that in your life, right? Uh, if it's post traumatic stress or I don't know what you call it, but no, that that that's it's not that. It's um, but basically if somebody guy comes in and in your head are like, all right, is this guy gonna when is this guy dead? Do I have to revive? Two is, is the guy going to die me in the next 30 seconds? Sure. No. Oh, okay. Is he going to die me the next 10 minutes? Oh, no. Oh, well, I can go to the library. You know what I mean? And, and find some. I can call somebody. I can right. Get it, right? Is the guy going to die me in two, three hours, right? And that's different than, you know, than, you know, my dad calling me, and I love my dad, uh, but he calls the office and says, hey, it's an emergency. Call me back. And my dad's 87. And uh, I'm saying, I, I call him back. I'm a dad. Are you okay? Did you fall down? Did you break your hip? What's going on? Right. He's like, no, the 12 is blinking on top of the VCR. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right, your definition of an emergency. Emergencies are all. My definition of emergency, <laughs> a little different. So again, in my head, uh, you know, and and even today, you know, because I have a, a wife and child and, and everything else, like, okay, this is really emergency. Well, nobody's going to die, okay, within the right. next thirty seconds, and and sometimes I can be annoying uh, when it, when it comes to that. But having said that, is is yeah, you, you, and then you go through it, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, and you go through it, and then you go through it again, and it's not just you, but your team as well. Right. Uh, that's going ahead and calling out and calling out injuries and uh, and all of that. And then you decide, okay, uh, do they need to go to the, to the OR? Do they go to CAT scan first? So a lot of trauma is logistics. What do you do first uh, and why and et cetera? And where I train is um, they, they really beat you over the head, appropriately so, in as much as all the traumas were recorded. 
So it was like a it was like game film over and over. Yeah, because so, you're trying to learn, of course. So you right? saw it over and over again. So if you screwed up in the trauma bay, you heard about it three times. You heard about it mm-hmm. in report the next day. You heard about it uh, with full sound and color uh, on trauma rounds, uh, the trauma uh, rounds once a week. Mm-hmm. And then you heard about it in a morbidity and mortality conference once a week. So you heard it a lot. And you know what? That's right. okay. Yeah. And that's so, how, you, how you learn. Right. And you learn with your foot in your mouth and you yeah. learn from your buddy's mistake and everything else like that. But that's how you learn. So that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so <clears throat> blunt versus a penetrating trauma. Uh, if you're a resident, penetrating is always better because you wind up in the operating room and you actually operate. Mm-hmm. Blunt trauma, a little less fun because then you're like, well, are we going to go to CT scan? Are we going to just kind of watch him? Are we gonna... It's not always so obvious, right? So, right. You're like, Ugh. So it's, it's kind of one of those things. So so blunt trauma, we'll, we'll separate this because we a lot of talk about uh, blunt and then subcategories of blunt uh, falls. And it's amazing to me because there's lots of falls and usually most of the falls are at home. And, you, and mm-hmm. you know, we know this for off of ladders or of, downstairs. Of an elderly. And a, a big thing in the elderly. Now, we talk about... Um, LD50s or lethal dose 50s, right? Which is defined as this happens, 50% of people will die, right? So bell-shaped curve from age zero to age 100, right? And that can be a drug, it can be a chemical, it can be a poison. But we talk about blunt trauma falls LD50. So an LD50 for most human beings is three times your height. So if mm. you're a six foot guy and you fall 18 feet, that's quite a quite half a fall, right? of people will die. Okay, right. so you hit your head, and again, it depends on how you land, what kind of shape you're in, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of trauma in just that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, in big cities, have seen it when stadiums, uh, right. we've, we, we've seen it in bridges. People um, are working on their house. Especially, yeah, well, yeah. And, and you know, uh, Governor uh, Gwynn back here in, in Nevada, who I always liked, that was his modus exotai was falling off the roof of his uh, of his mm-hmm. house. Now, uh, so... Uh, having said that, is his bridges, and that was again big in Philadelphia because we had the Ben Franklin Bridge and the Walt Whitman Bridge, and then we also had some smaller bridges around town. And then I was in San Francisco; they had the Golden Gate Bridge, of course. So the smaller bridges around town were interesting because they weren't quite high enough to kill you. Oh, and so so would you get these, jumpers that were trying to. Well, yeah, and so that's that's the the question is you have jumpers that are actually trying to kill themselves or right. they just spawned or whatever. Sure. But the ones that that went off the lower bridges, they would come in with usually spine uh, injuries and leg injuries. You usually go vertical at a little bit of an angle, etc. And so that's the kind of injuries that you know we see in the quote in these survivors right. of jumpers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The most big bridges now, like the Golden Gate bridges and such, they have big yellow boxes, suicide hotlines. Right. Uh, that say, you know, hey, call us, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the Golden Gate Bridge, there's been lots of books and stories uh, about this. There's some iron workers that actually patrol the bridge now. They go back and forth mm-hmm. looking for folks. It's closed to pedestrians uh, at, uh, at night. They, um, there's one guy, a CHP officer, uh, Kevin Briggs, who is uh, nicknamed the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge, who himself talked more than 200 people off of the bridge. Wow. And uh, he lost two, but more than 200 he saved. It's amazing. Which is really cool. And then they are currently going through this netting project, which is way over budget. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of, actually, a lot of cities have done that. They, on their bridges, they've actually put up nets where you can't yeah. actually... Yeah, so yeah, it makes it a lot harder. So, so yeah, so there is a consciousness uh, of that, but there's some fascinating movies and stories uh, about uh, about that. Ju- just that right. is, uh, is is falling. Much more common uh, on blunt trauma is autos. And sure. uh, yeah. the thing with autos is people again don't realize the physics, the force that's behind it, right? And if you were Usain Bolt, right, world's fastest human, right, and you t- and you said, uh, hey, Mr. Bolt. We want you to run as fast as you can, you know, for the next 50 yards. And he can get it to about 25 miles an hour, right? And we want you to go run straight into that wall. You look at you like you're out of your mind, right? (laughs) But we do first. (laughs) Right right behind you. But we do 25 in parking lots. Mm. Okay? And and, and that sort of stuff nowadays. And in Philadelphia, they used to have this thing. I don't know. Probably can't, can't do it anymore. They used to bring it to the hospitals. And it was... This big, uh, it was like a, it was like a big flatbed truck, and they had this chair on top that it looked like it was on rails, right? It had a couple wheels, and there was like two rails, like a railroad car, and it was like at about a yeah, thirty-five degree angle. And the teenagers, they would say, they would strap the teenager in there, and they would pull the thing, and you would roll down maybe about eh, fifteen, twenty feet, mm-hmm. and it would boom, stop you, right. okay, and with a seatbelt on, right? So you got to maybe about ten miles an hour, right. fifty miles an hour. But you go bam against the uh, the seatbelt, and that was a convincer. Like, 
holy smokes. You know what I mean? He says, yeah, yeah man, that's only 10 or 15 It reminds me of out. driving with my grandfather and rolling around his old Chevy with the, oh, yeah, please. <laughs> the lap belts. <laughs> oh, the lap belts. So funny. I mean, yeah, back in the day, you know, of it's course. Sort of funny, not funny. But. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to know, you know, the, 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 you know, the station wagon when you're in the back and you're running around <laughs> exactly. and you're flopping around with the dog and the, your buddy <laughs> and your brother and so th- things are much, much better now. There are crumple zones now. Right. Um, there are safety glass. Safety glass is amazing. Because back in the 70s, early 80s, again, getting into more plastics, is people's faces would go through the glass and they would just get shredded. Right. Shredded. And so now with the safety glass, you don't get that uh, as much. Also, between the um, seat belts, between the crumple zones, between the safety glass and the, uh, the airbags have really decreased a lot of the facial lacerations and facial fractures. And right. so nowadays, facial fractures from uh, from uh, autos are really getting kind of rare, uh, which mm-hmm. is an absolute blessing. And uh, um, so that's that's really, really yeah, a big thing. Is that something that, brace, that you've actually, as a plastic surgeon, have you dealt with those kind of traumas quite a bit in terms of doing repairs? Sure. Or, the, yeah. the thing that will keep you up at night if you take a call as a plastic surgeon typically is uh, facial fractures in the hand. And facial fractures from uh, human-to-human violence, guys getting in fights, et cetera, et cetera. It's Las Vegas. Versus, so. uh, well, yeah, especially in <laughs> Philly to San Francisco, <laughs> right. and L.A., yeah. so where I trained. And, uh, yeah, so you get those, you know what I mean, or, mm-hmm. you know, baseball, bat versus head or, you know, whatever the case may be. But, but yeah, uh, those, those things, thankfully, at least technologically, and a car has gotten better. Person-to-person interaction, less so. But, yeah, it's but that's, always unpredictable. But, right, but that, that's, that's kind of where, where that is. But, but yeah, that's, that's something, and you have to, again, you go through, you know, airway breathing circulation. So, you know, how do I fix this fracture and still make sure I protect his airway? Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. How do I uh, go ahead and preserve... Uh, his facial structure so they can see uh, without uh, double vision all the time. Or minimize scarring. Or right, and, and all of that. So, yeah, so and structural and, and everything. And it's really, it's an amazing jigsaw puzzle sometimes to go ahead and right. put this together. Because if you're off from the your upper jaw to your lower jaw, if your teeth, people will know their teeth are off by two millimeters. And so that's one of the things when you wire them all right. shut, and you put uh, plates and screws in, you do all the things, and you wire, and then uh, you wake them up and you're like, eh, do you think it's right? And they're like, yeah, I think it's right. You know, and right. maybe off a little bit or something along those lines. And then you have to make it meet your uh, patient uh, back in uh, San Francisco General. We had a lot of homeless guys and they would get their jaws broken or whatever reason. And we would say to them, look, uh, you know, go to McDonald's, get some of those, you know, salts uh, that you have, like that you shake them on fries and uh, go get some water and then put the salt in the water and swish and spit it out, you know, and that's as good as it's going to get for him. Right. You know, uh, but it's the, you know, and then. But you want to keep them do. intact so they can function. Well, yeah, you want to, yeah, you want to, yeah, you, you got to gear it towards their living conditions. And of course, we always see them in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So. Right. But to, uh, to all of uh, that is basically Otto's facial stuff has gotten much, much better. And of course, uh, operational techniques have gotten much better uh, over the years uh, mm-hmm. as well. So um, the other interesting thing with auto systems is the uh, OnStar system. Well, back then it was the OnStar system. Now a lot of folks have it. Back in Philadelphia in the 90s, it was relatively new. And so the fanciest cars, right there, the Cadillacs, the Mercedes Benz stuff, they, they had them. And I still remember this one uh, lady, she came in and, uh, you know, kind of dressed real nice, kind of fancy, had a big updo going and, and such. Uh, auto accident. And she told us the story and she had some injuries. She told the story. She was, you know, driving her her uh, Benz. It was winter, so it was all white. And she had uh, she actually had the, the top down, and uh, and she hit uh, ice, which happens infrequently. She went off the road and and, and wound up hitting a tree. Uh, she loses consciousness, regains consciousness when the OnStar system says, "Mrs. Smith, excuse right. me, Mrs. Yeah. Smith." She opens her eyes. Everything it's as sometimes it is in the country. It's quiet. And it's all white. It's like just snowed. And she looks down and she's, you know, she's all white. And it's just, and she's looking around. She's like, oh my gosh. She's like, am I in heaven? <laughs> and the, and the OnStar. I should laugh. And, yeah. the, and the OnStar guy says, no, you've had an auto accident. You're off route, you know, you know, da, da, right, da, da, right. Da, do you need help? Yes. <laughs> and so, and then, and going back to the trauma thing we just talked about, there was no OnStar, you know, when, uh, when, when uh, doctors, uh, went ahead and uh, had his big wreck, and then nobody came to help him. But, right. But OnStar was in the car, ready to send go help for this, you know, this lady. Yeah. So that, in a, again, you know, self has gotten yeah. ha- has gotten uh, a lot better mm-hmm. uh, as well. And then um, with blunt trauma, as well, you have to go ahead and check for 
certain things. And again, you go from head to toe and you go multiple times. And some, some of the things that you see is like for CSF leagues, you get there and this guy looks like he's got a runny nose. Hmm. And you're like, uh oh, so what do you mean? The young guy's like, what do you mean? You got a runny nose. No, when you go ahead and you check some filter paper and there's, there's a ring on it, and what that means is you may have a leak of his CSF or his uh, cerebral flannel fluid, right? right? Yeah. And so that, like, mm -mm, this guy's probably got uh, a big bad fracture or maybe even a smaller fracture, but a big bad injury to his head. And I just remember this one poor guy, motorcycle guy, I just got clobbered. And one of the nursing students and stuff was coming out of his ears. And she says, is he going to do well? I'm like, no. Yeah. So and you just yeah it's 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 tough. Um, motorcycles are yeah yeah the thing with motorcycles and and I have buddies who ride and they you know and it's usually not the motorcyclist you know except for the guys that are doing silly stuff and we all n know them right but um, basically you know your regular rider um, there was a journal uh, article that uh, at a journal of trauma and basically said that um, if you ride a motorcycle consistently for five years, your rate of having an accident, a serious to real serious accident, is 100%. Yeah. I so, know. and it's usually left turn, and it's usually the other guy didn't see you, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's almost so, always, I think it's almost always. I've had actually had three friends that, that died on motorcycles. Yeah. I grew up driving, driving motorcycles as a kid, but it was off-road. Which yeah. is still dangerous enough, but yeah. but um, I, I think I mentioned that to you. There was a, actually a trauma nurse on TikTok, and she gave her five things not to do. One of them was don't t or do not stop taking your blood pressure medication, which is important. But one of her top ones was do not ride a motorcycle yeah. for that specific reason because yeah. they had seen so many. Oh, so many. Yeah, and yeah, we call them donor cycles. Yes, we do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, right. but uh, and then especially with the the helmet mandate, which has really saved a lot of you know brains and uh, and, right. and and uh, and lives. And, it doesn't help you so much that. when you get run over by a truck or a car. No, so, <laughs> but, yeah. so, but have, and then you know people come in and they didn't wear their leathers and stuff and they go sliding along and then you have to treat them like a burn unit because they have this road rash. Yeah. Uh, and, and you try to debreed them, but it never works. So typically, I would always take them. And again, things have changed. But I was always, I always told generals, you know, I put them out, and that way you can really go ahead and right. the heck out of them and, sure. and everything else. Um, but uh, and, and there's other things that you do during the trauma resuscitation to uh, check for, you know, uh, tone and see if they have a neurological injury, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, yeah. So that's the penetrating. Uh, that's the blunt uh, portion. Uh, of that sort of thing. Right. What's, what would be your advice to people? Say you somebody comes up on a wreck, somebody comes up on a motorcycle wreck, whatever it might be. What would be your advice to somebody who's trying to help? What should they do and what should they definitely not do? Right. Well, every again, everyone is a little bit different in as much as, you know, especially if you're not well-versed in pre-hospital care, and some docs are not. Right? right. So, and but and even so, just as a, just as a, a regular person. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, see, I'm saying even some doctors themselves, oh, and they want right. they want to show right. up the skin and start running it. Okay. Right. Sometimes that'll work, and sometimes, but if you know, if you're in LA County or Philly or you know New York, these guys have seen it all. Sure. So you can say, and they usually run on protocols. And if you're an anesthesiologist, if you're an airway management specialist, okay, now that's one thing. Or mm -hmm. or you can go ahead and start giving drugs. So, so every city, every county is a little bit different on that one. To answer your question is is First of all, you know, look around. First of all, is the scene safe? Okay, right. are they still in the middle of the road? You know, uh, is you know, there flames coming out of the back of the car? So number one is, is you know, you got to make sure that it's safe as much as possible. The other two is, is you know, if you're there by yourself or you're there with somebody else, one of you guys, you know, calls get help. You know, nine one one is there for you know a reason. Get some help. Then again, you know, it's kind of airway, breathing, circulation. See if they have an airway. See if they're breathing. Uh, what's the circulation look like? And by that, I mean. Are they bleeding profusely? Do you have to apply a tourniquet on, et cetera, et cetera? And then usually the big thing for civilians uh, is a uh, spine stabilization. In other mm -hmm. words, try not to you know yank them out of the car and, and right, unless you thing. absolutely have to, right? right? Yeah. So that's why these guys you know have C collars and they put the backboards and everything else to try to move them all in one piece, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So so again, you know, you, you one remain calm, two use your judgment. Don't give them water. Don't give them, you know, don't give them food, etc. If they're bleeding, you know, stop the bleeding. See what'll actually kill them first, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then do that. Cars on fire, yeah. Go ahead and try to take them out of one piece, you know, best you can with spine precautions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
car not on fire, you know, you, you might want to wait for help unless you can go ahead and really kind of done this before, uh, right. et cetera, to, to, to do all that. Yeah. Uh, and again, keep a clear head and keep things calm. Yeah. And in terms of blunt trauma, another thing that we kind of talked about before we started was um, kids and sports. So we see a lot of stuff with that. With And we just saw that with um, the football player that collapsed not really a blunt trauma situation, but it reminds us that those sport, sports, even at a young age, can be somewhat dangerous. Sure. Um, what's some of the common stuff that you would see with kids in that situation? And again, what would be the thing, like if my kid's playing football, he goes down on the field, what's, what's the thing as a parent? What should they do and not do in that situation? Right. So, yeah, so athletic injuries are usually uh, blunt versus penetrating. You hope it's not penetrating. Right. Uh, in, in, in that, and that's most organized youth sports activities uh, have really gone out of their way to try to protect the kids, right? So that's why there's, you know, batting helmets. That's why you wear right. pads um, and that sort of thing. In the lacrosse world, to be a lacrosse coach, you can't just show up and uh, say, hi, I'm, I'm Coach Roth. I'm here today. They actually make you take a... Um, that's actually a, a pretty dangerous sport. <laughs> a course. Yeah, a course and a test and all that kind of stuff for that, which I think is, which I think is great. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we just... You, you, you touched on a comedic cordis, which is basically very, thankfully, very rare. I think there's been like 250, I think, documented cases of that. And what that is, is, is blunt trauma to the chest with enough force to go ahead and, and impact the heart. But it's, it's a really, it's a one in a million shot because you have to hit it right at where the heart repolarizes itself, right before the T wave. And mm -hmm. so, and again, if you're a football player and you're running down this field, your heart may be going 100 miles. A, a, a one, sure. I mean, they're trained athletes and everything, but you're running full tilt at somebody. So it's probably going not 160, but, you know, um, 100 beats per minute right. to go ahead and get that hit with that much force at that time to go ahead and set it off. And what happens is, is basically it hit it and then kind of depolarized or basically short circuited the electrical system in the heart. And so now you're in fibrillation, which means everything is firing, you know, not in sync. And so what they did was is they tried to put him back into sync with CPR. CPR is to kind of continue to get the heart uh, pumping the blood with oxygen to around brain, it. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And closed CPR is about 40% cardiac output. Open CPR, when I actually cut open the chest and have my hands on both sides of the heart, you make the alligator's mouth and you go in and squeeze mm -hmm. about 70%. Okay. So if you're going to do CPR, and everybody should learn CPR, at least BCLS. Especially around youth sports. So especially around uh, any of that stuff. Push hard. So with little ladies and little men, I typically will break ribs. And yeah. uh, and so so you got to push hard because you're their heart. The other thing they did well is uh, put an AED on, an automatic uh, electric defibrillator. And basically what that is, it, these things are unbelievable. Put the pad on the front, the pad on the back. It goes ahead and reads the EKG, and the machine will say, okay, shock them, don't shock them, or whatever. Oh, wow. And then you stand back, and, and then it says, you know, clear, and then you press the button, boom, and it shocks, and it gives, it gives uh, electricity in a fashion to that get it back into rhythm. It yeah. puts it back into the proper rhythm. Mm -hmm. And they have them on all airports now, and we're trying to get tourniquets next to AEDs, et cetera, et right. cetera. So um, I think it's a rule, uh, and, and, and where this happens coming to court, is usually baseball, uh, hockey, lacrosse, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes football. Uh, that's why la lacrosse. Uh, goalies wear uh, chest protectors, yeah. and in I think I believe at the college level, I'm not sure at a high school level, uh, there's got to be an AED on the field right. uh, before they uh, before they start, uh, just for that uh, that sort of thing. The ADs are, are amazing. And the other thing, one fact is uh, one of the best places to have a uh, cardiac arrest um, is uh, on the casino floor. Uh, That's pretty common, uh, right? Because yeah. um, because the response time is so good because mm. nothing gets watched more than a casino floor, right? right? Yeah, there's cameras everywhere. 100 yeah. cameras or there's, there's all sorts Lots of undercover of guys, ton of security. So if you're playing slots and you keel over, there's probably going to be somebody there in about 30 seconds. Yeah. And most of these guys now <clears throat> and gals are EMT trained and they usually will grab their and they will grab the uh, AED and get it on you fast. The faster you get the AD and CPR and blood and oxygen flow to the head, your survival rate goes way up. So the survival rate on a casino floor is really good uh, as opposed to it does make out sense. on the street and yeah. everything else like that, which is kind of strange. And also, I mean, to, to me, it would seem like that first minute or two minutes. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, that's why there's so much praise with the, uh, for the, uh, the, the Bills uh, staff, yeah. and they did great. They were there uh, DeMar Hamlin seconds. was yeah. the player, right? Yeah, so they were there within 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, okay, they knew something was wrong. And he performed CPR for, I think, nine minutes. Yeah, so yeah. And CPR is hard. 
uh, by the way, you work up a, a sweat. And right. so sometimes it's where you'll see people switch off and, and all that stuff. The other thing they do is they control the airway mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, really well. And so and they, you know, packed them up and, and got them out to uh, a tertiary care center. And they they did uh, really well with him. Right. So, uh, so yeah, so basically, so to answer your question is, is, yeah, so I'm sitting there watching my kid lacrosse game or pop war game and, you know, the kid goes down, right? So... Um, it, here in Las Vegas, in high school football, there's a, a physician on the sideline or the game doesn't start. Oh, interesting. So, because uh, a buddy of mine, an orthopedic uh, surgeon, would have uh, That's great. Would have that the duty. So, so typically those those injuries are uh, orthopedic in, uh, in, you know, in nature. You know, mm -hmm. they blow out their knee, they twist their ankle, whatever. Sure. Sometimes they're neurologic, got knocked out. Okay? Right. Sometimes uh, pulmonary, got the wind knocked out of me. Uh, rarely, thankfully, cardiac. Um, but yeah, so the, the main thing is, is again, step one, don't panic. Uh, hmm. step two. Yeah. Cause you got parents screaming. You, got yeah, you have to whole, right? assess, uh, the, the situation again, basics, airway, breathing, circulation, mm -hmm. you know, disability, what's going on here. And then, and then you just kind of run the algorithm, you know, from there. Yeah. So, and then, you know, can he get up? Can he not get up? Is what type of injury is it? Uh, do you need a backboard collar? Then you go that to a, a hospital. But, you know, it, it just really kind of depends on the injury and mm -hmm. then what your assessment is on the field. So Yeah, it's good. I mean, that's great information. And I think, like you said, I think uh, coming back to all the beginning of that is in those situations is really controlling emotions, triaging the situation, keep them alive first. And then yeah. going beyond that, of course, and yeah. fixing whatever you can fix. Yeah. And then things are, you know, things are different. We Like it says, you can everything kind of presents uh, a little bit different and that's where experience comes from and all that as well. So that's why we train as long as we, we do so that hopefully at some point, say, Oh, I've seen this before yeah. or Oh, my buddy, you know, uh, talked to me about this, something along those right. lines. So, well, like you said too, in that situation, you're the quarterback, you're calling the plays and you've, you've got to be calm and cool headed and ex the experiences. There's only one way to really get that experience is to by, by going through that, Right, that training, the training that you went the through. training program, and uh, right. and thankfully it was there for me, and it continues to be there for uh, the the younger folks. I mean, we're trained to show up at a uh, plane wreck and run it. Right. Okay? So that I mean, that's that's you know our training goes. We know did triage, red blanket, yellow blanket, green blanket. You know, you can call mortalities, et cetera, et cetera. And you never ever want to have to do that. Right. And uh, but sometimes you know my military friends, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know that it, it, yeah. that comes into play. Yeah, a lot of people when they think of triage and, and and that kind of situation, they think of shows like Mash. There's a lot of the TV ER doctors. Well, what's your thought on that? Like when you watch those shows, what's are you are you like oh kind of second hand quarterbacking or are you? Oh, well, I'm I'm annoying. Armchair. I'm, I'm, I'm annoying. My my wife won't watch them with me. <laughs> Because we watch House, and I'm like, oh, she's just my son. I'm like, Do house. you mind? I love the House. Right? <laughs> That's such a great. Some, show. You know, he says, oh yeah, no, you know, he went you know, swimming in the Nile, and then he's going to be she's just my. <laughs> Do you mind? I, said, well, I went to medical school, you know. Anyway, so no, I mean, there's some stuff that that really does get a lot of stuff right, and they and they have they usually have some pretty good uh, medical people helping out. I mean, sure. I, I get calls I, now and then from. Um, Hollywood producer guys and just kind of run this by you. I'm like, yeah, no, you want to change this word to this word. Oh, okay. Right. So that's sort of, yeah. And then sometimes you, you know, and anybody can, you know, bust their chops. I mean, yeah. Okay. The IV lines in backwards. Okay, fine. You know, we wouldn't have done it this way. Would it? I know. Okay, fine. So yeah, but by and large, just kind of go with it you yeah. know, a, a little bit and you get, get to the point and it's dramatic and some stuff. Yeah. You see, it's like, no, 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 you would never, you'd never do it that, uh, that way, but okay. Just let, let, you know, let the story run, you know? So I shouldn't take you to a movie with like a lot of medical stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm good. I, yeah, I, I've learned. I've learned to sh to shut up. Uh, so, but yeah, so but some yeah, some stuff is is really kind of uh, closer to home, and some of it's really kind of uh, uh, way out there. But uh, but by by and large, they usually do a, a, a decent job. Yeah, well, that's that, good. That sort of yeah, stuff. You, you'd hope they would do their research. I would yeah. assume. Um, how can people find you online? Oh, we're all over the place. Oh, actually, uh, we, I should say everywhere. But, everywhere, yes. Yeah. So, well, uh, online we have our website, which is the cornerstone which is www.jjrothmd.com. Uh, and then we uh, also are on uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram and uh, uh, LinkedIn and all kinds of good yeah, stuff. And that's at Las Vegas Plastic Surgery on those. Yeah, so absolutely. So, And uh, we answer the phone. We, we actually use the telephone. So if you have a question or a concern or you want to hear something on the phone, uh, uh, it's something on that program, by all means, pick up the phone or contact us uh, any which way. And 
we actually do look at the stuff. And uh, as evidence today, we're talking about stuff that uh, uh, some listeners have wanted to know about. Right. And if you have questions or topics you'd like us to cover, please feel free to message us on those too. Sounds great. All right. And then uh, uh, next, we'll do a little more trauma, trauma trauma-rama. Today, we're going to do penetrating trauma in uh, our next one. So, uh, so yeah, V, that's that's the best teaser I got. So uh, be ready for that. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Please like and subscribe our show on your favorite podcast network. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us. For further information, please visit the podcast website link for Dr. Jeffrey Roth. See you next time.